You're listening to the Gospel Coalition podcast, equipping the next generation of believers, pastors, and church leaders to shape life and ministry around the gospel. On today's episode, we bring you a breakout session led by Christopher Yuan on holy sexuality. This workshop was originally held at the Gospel Coalition's 2019 National Conference in Indianapolis. We live in a world of infinite shades of gray, not just 50. Ambiguity is now a virtue. Sexual freedom has essentially become the religion of the land. The deception of our historical epoch is this. Your sexual desires define you, determine you, and should always delight you. Since the fall of Adam and Eve, the human heart has set itself in defiance against God's perfect ways. And I love what John Piper said yesterday about idols, because we have turned sexual identity into an idol, and yet idols have no currency in heaven. And yet this idolatry we find in the world and even in the church is on a collision course with the good news of Jesus Christ, just as my life was on a collision course with the gospel. So I came out to my parents in 1993. My, um, it was actually, I, I told them I am gay. This was my declaration. Amazingly, through that declaration, my mother first came to faith, and then afterward, my father did as well. At that time, my unbelieving mother, though, rejected me before she came to faith, which is completely counter to the narrative that we hear today, that somehow Christian parents are not able to, cannot love their gay children. But I had the exact opposite experience. My mother couldn't, my unbelieving mother couldn't accept me as a gay son, and it wasn't until she became a follower of Christ that she could do nothing other than to love me as God loved her even when she was a sinner, even when she was powerless, even when she was his enemy. So it was after fully coming out of the closet that that set me on the trajectory toward a destructive path, which involved promiscuity and even drug use. And to be clear, not all gays and lesbians do drugs. Not all gay men are promiscuous. Some are, some are not. But that is part of my story, and when I tell it, I have to be honest about that. But I also want to tell you that when you encounter Jesus, he will impact every aspect of your life. So I began experimenting with drugs, and this is all while I was pursuing my doctorate in dentistry in Louisville, Kentucky. But like my classmates, I didn't have much money, and I needed to find a way to support my habit, and I did that by selling drugs. And I sold to friends, classmates, even a professor. See, I actually thought I could live this double life of being a graduate student by day and a promiscuous drug dealer by night. But three months before I was to receive my doctorate, the administration expelled me. So my, uh, I moved to the bright lights in big city of Atlanta, Georgia. And there I quickly, I just kept doing what I knew how to do best, that was sell drugs. And I became a supplier to other dealers in over a dozen states. In addition, it was nothing for me to have multiple anonymous sexual encounters each and every day. Because according to the world, I had it all. Money, fame, drugs, and sex. I had exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And I began worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. Because in my world, I had become God. My parents had no clue that I was doing drugs or even selling drugs, but they knew my biggest need was to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. They tried to reach out to the love of Christ, wanted nothing to do with it. They came to visit me one time in Atlanta, and I told them to get out. And they weren't preaching at me, telling me what to do, what not to do, but just the fact that God had so radically transformed their lives that they radiated Christ, that was offensive to me. And I told them to leave. I didn't even give them an opportunity to call up their friends to pick them up. Before my dad left, he gave me his Bible. It was all dog-eared. And I told my dad, I don't want your Bible. But he left it on my kitchen counter anyway and walked out the door. 
And as soon as they left, I took my dad's Bible and I threw it in the trash. I wanted nothing to do with the Bible and certainly nothing to do with God. And after that visit, it was more than obvious to my parents that I was totally unreachable and completely hopeless. But my parents committed not to focus on the hopelessness, but upon the promises of God. And along with over 100 prayer warriors from their church, from their Bible study fellowship group, they began to cry out to God for me. My mother began to pray a bold prayer. God, do whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to you. In her desperation, she fasted every Monday for seven years and once fasted 39 days on my behalf. She would literally spend hours every morning in her prayer closet, interceding for me, for many others. She knew that it was going to take nothing short of a miracle to bring this prodigal son to the father. And a miracle is exactly what God did. This miracle came with a bang on my door. I opened up my door and on my front doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police, and two big German shepherd dogs. <laughs> I just received a large amount of drugs, not my largest, but they confiscated all my money and my drugs. And I was charged with a street value equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. With that amount, I was facing 10 years to life in federal prison. I'd started with a bright future among society's finest, and I found myself in the ditch among society's despised in the Atlantic City Detention Center. So I tried calling home, and I did not want to make that phone call. As I imagined the earful that I was going to get on the other line, but my mother's first words were, son, are you okay? No condemnation, just words of unconditional love and grace. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Notice Paul isn't saying that it's God's anger. It's not God's wrath, but it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And even on that miserable day, God was pouring out his grace and drawing me to himself through the words of my mother. Actually, my mom was excited to get that phone call, if you're going to believe it or not, because <laughs> I hadn't called home in years. And she knew without a doubt that this was God's answer to her prayers. So as she hung up that phone, fighting back the tears, she knew she had to do like that good old hymn says. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. No matter what storm she was going through, she had to count her blessings. So she set the phone down, and next to the phone happened to be a calculator, and she tore off a little piece of the adding machine tape, and she wrote down these first blessings. Christopher is in a safe place compared to before. And he called home for the very first time. As my years in prison passed, she kept adding to this list and counting her blessings. And this list is longer and taller than she is. Both sides. Three days later, I was walking around the cell block. And if I could be honest with you, I was really doing my best to stay to myself because I certainly didn't want to mingle very much with those really bad people, you know, those criminals. <laughs> and I passed by this garbage can. And I looked at this trash and I, this is my life. I'm from upper middle class, suburb of Chicago. My father has two doctorates. I was only three months away from receiving my own doctorate. I had it made. 
But now I found myself among common criminals. Trash. With my head down, I was about to pass by that garbage can, but something on top of the trash caught my eye. I bent over, picked it up, and it was a Gideon's New Testament. I took that New Testament back to my cell, opened up that good book, book for the first time I read through the entire Gospel of Mark. But let me tell you, I wasn't thinking this is the answer to my problems. Actually, I simply thought that I've got a lot of time on my hands and a better pass it somehow. <laughs> But as we know, what we have in our Bibles is not just ink on paper, but what we have in our Bibles, ladies and gentlemen, is the very breath of God. And it is living and powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword, able to cut through the hardest of hearts, exposing my sin, my rebellion, and it wasn't a pre-sight. And I thought things couldn't get any worse. I was wrong. A couple weeks later, I was called to the nurse's office. The nurse sat me down, and I knew something wasn't right. She was uncomfortably struggling with the words, so she wrote something on a piece of paper and slowly slid it across the desk to me. I looked down. And I saw three letters and a symbol. It read HIV positive. The days after were dark and lonely. I was sentenced to six years, much better than 10 years to life. But news of my HIV status felt like a death sentence. One night I was laying in my bed and I look up at the metal bunk above me and someone had scribbled something and it read, if you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. <laughs> for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You see, at the most hopeless point in my life, the Lord God was using the words penned by a prophet thousands of years ago to a rebellious nation, Israel, to tell me that regardless of who I was and what I had done in my past, he still had a plan for me. I had no clue where that plan was going to take me, but God gave me enough faith, enough strength to get through that one day and the next, and the next. My transformation was gradual. I really wish I could tell you that at that moment, I said a sinner's prayer, and then everything after that was perfect, like no more problems. Far from the truth. God was convicting me of my idols, which were many. The most obvious was sexual identity. The most obvious actually was drugs. That I mean, I'm in prison for that. That's the most obvious. But within a few months, God delivered me from that bondage. Within a, God kept bringing to mind other idols, other dependencies in that one, my sexual identity, was one that I felt like I just couldn't let go of. So I was reading through the Bible, and it was so clear to me that God loved me unconditionally. I kept reading, and I came across some passages, three in the old, three in the new, that seemed to condemn that core part of who I thought I was, my sexuality. So I went to a chaplain, and I asked him his opinion. And to my surprise, this chaplain actually told me that the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality. And he even even gave me a book explaining that view. So with much curiosity, I took that book in the hopes of finding biblical justification for homosexuality. I had that book in one hand and the Bible in the other. Just think about this. I had every reason in the world to accept what that book is claiming to justify the way I had been living. But God's indwelling Holy Spirit convicted me that those assertions from that book were a clear distortion of God, His Word, and His unmistakable condemnations against same-sex relationships. I couldn't even finish that book, and I gave it back to the chaplain which meant I turned to the Bible alone. 
And I went through every verse, every chapter, every page of scripture looking for justification. I went through the whole Bible. I went cover to cover several times. I had time. I looked (laughs) and I looked and I looked and I couldn't find any. So I was at a turning point and a decision had to be made. Either abandon God in his word, live as a gay man, pursue a monogamous same-sex relationship by allowing my attractions, get this, by allowing my sexual attractions to dictate not only who I was, but also how I lived. Or abandon pursuing a monogamous same-sex relationship. How? by freeing myself from my sexual identity, by not allowing my desires to dictate who I am and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. My decision was clear and obvious. I followed Jesus. As the days and the weeks and the months of abstinence passed, I realized that my sexuality should not be the core of who I am. You know, I told myself before, God loves me unconditionally, and that's true. But don't we as sinners, don't we like to add to God's truth? I added, so therefore he doesn't want me to change. Similar to when your friends say, God loves me just the way I am, so leave me alone. But after reading through the Bible, I learned that unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. Let me say it again. Unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. My identity should not be defined by my sexuality. My identity shouldn't be grounded in my desires. My identity is not gay, is not ex-gay, is not even heterosexual for that matter. Because my identity as a child of the living God must be in Jesus Christ alone. God says, be holy for I am holy. You know, I had thought that if I were to become a Christian, that I would have to become a heterosexual, that somehow the more sexually attracted I were to women, the more of a Christian man I would be. But I realized that even if I had opposite sex attractions, I would still need to flee temptation. I would still need to put to death my sin nature. So actually, heterosexuality is not the goal. Besides, God does not command us, be heterosexual for I am heterosexual. (laughs) But neither did God say, be homosexual, for I am homosexual. Rather, God said, be holy, for I am holy. So therefore, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. That's not the goal. But the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. As a matter of fact, the opposite of every sin struggle is holiness. I don't need to focus upon whether I'm tempted. We will be tempted. Jesus Christ himself was tempted. We don't need to, I don't need to focus on whether I'm going to struggle because we will struggle. But I need to focus upon living a life of holiness and living a life of purity. Because change is not the absence of temptations. God does not promise you, come to Jesus and you'll never be tempted again. No, change is not the absence of temptations. But change is the spirit-wrought ability to be holy even in the midst of temptations. Because the ultimate issue is not whether I'm struggling, not whether I'm tempted, but the ultimate issue is that I yearn after God in total surrender and complete obedience. As I began to live this life of surrender and obedience, God began to reveal his plan for my life, and he called me to full-time vocational ministry while I was in prison of all places. And I realized it didn't matter where I was, whether I was in prison or out of prison, because my calling would remain the same regardless of location. And with that change of heart, God did another miracle. And he shortened my sentence from six years to three years, which is almost unheard of in the federal system. So with only about a year left of my prison sentence, I knew that if I was going to continue on in ministry after prison, I'd better learn more about the Bible than just prison religion. So I called them, collected my parents, told them I think God's calling me into ministry, and I asked them to mail me an application to the only Bible college I had ever heard of at that time, which is in Chicago, called Moody Bible Institute. But there was silence on the other line because I think they both dropped their phones. (laughs) (laughs) They mailed the application into me to prison. I was so excited when I got it torn open and began filling it out until I got to the last page where they asked me for references. Not from anybody, but these had to be people who knew me as a Christian for at least one year. I had some slim pickets in prison, but I was able to persuade a prison chaplain, a prison guard, and another prison inmate to write my reference to Moody. So amazingly, Moody actually accepted me. I was released from prison July of, praise the Lord. I was released from prison July of 2001, and I started the very next month in August of 2001. So imagine the surprise of my classmates when I answered their question, what did you do this summer? (laughs) 
Graduated from Moody 2005, went on to my master's in exegesis uh, at Wheaton College Graduate School, received my doctorate in ministry in 2014. And then I had the immense honor of co-authoring co co a book, as Chris uh, just mentioned, called Out of a Far Country, A Gay Son's Journey to God, A Broken Mother's Search for Hope. Um, actually, we found out uh, a few years ago that Christian high schools have been using this as a textbook. This, this teacher even emailed, he's, emailed us and he's like, we, I have the hardest time making my students read any textbook, but not this. <laughs> so we're really uh, blessed that God is still continuing to use not our story, but the story of God in the lives of broken people. My new book, um, Holy Sexuality in the Gospel, just came out uh, in November of last year. And that actually, in essence, was a continuation of my first book. So think about my first book as a uh, book for the heart. Um, the second book is a book for the head and for the hands, because I think oftentimes we want to love right and, and love the gay community, and we want to do right, but we do right or try to do right before we think right. And we don't, when we don't think right before we do right, actually we could be doing wrong, even with the best intentions. So my goal in uh, doing this uh, was to not to, to, to do what other people have done. I, I've, you know, there's a lot of books that are very pragmatic on how to love um, or how that uh, may be focusing on uh, being, you know, friendship. And I, I think we need to also, we need to step back and begin with some biblical theological foundation, more so than just what do these six passages say, because other, other books have done a great job um, in doing that. Kevin DeYoung is a good kind of summary of all these books. What does the Bible really teach about homosexuality? And uh, so books have done that well, but I think we need to realize that that can't be our only answer. A robust theology of sexuality can't be built simply on what's not allowed. For the Christian life, much it is much more than simply the avoidance of sinful behavior. Our day-to-day -day life is not what I shouldn't do. Because if scriptural prohibitions are the only lens through which we see things and which we live, we could very well miss the gospel. So my hope actually is not to touch on these six passages kind of doing exegetical work, but actually using systematic and biblical theology to help undergird our understanding so that we can com be compelled into the action. Because I know right away people think, I'm not a theologian. We're all theologians. Well, I, I, I need something really practical. There's nothing more practical than good theology. Actually, I would argue it's bad theology that leads to apathy. So it's, I think it's foundational for us to do this. Rosaria Butterfield, I think for me, is like the most important voice on this issue of sexuality. But I think she did a great job in one of the first books that, that really undergirded this conversation on sexuality with philosophy, theology, and worldview. Um, so th that was my, my goal. Actually, my subtitle, I wanted to be Sex, Design, Relationship Shaped by Biblical and Systematic Theology, but my publisher shot me down. I mean, I don't know why. Like, I would have bought the book. <laughs> so... Um, you know, we, how do we build this, um, this, this framework well? And in my ministry uh, with, my, uh, with my parents, actually it's our ministry, I get to travel around the nation, around the world as a two-generational ministry, how cool is that? That God has really given us back the years that the locusts have taken away. And so we, we really do. I actually, um, I have a policy. I don't travel alone. I'm single. So my mother always, she's in the back. You just say hi to her. She, she's my prayer warrior. She's always there. She's heard me speak thousands of times and probably bored of me speaking, uh, but we do speak together as well with my dad who's at home right now. Um, but in our ministry to parents, um, we often have, uh, you know, have the honor of being able to listen to stories. And there was one mother, uh, it was really interesting, and she was really hurting and broken and, and kind of through sobs, she was explaining to me how she just wished her son to be normal. And you know, in those situations, you, you just listen. You listen, cry, pray. There's really not that much we can say. And she was kind of explaining more. I want my son just, just to be normal. That was one, one explanation she talked about. And, and as she kind of explained more, she said she had another son. And, you know, why can't my gay son just be like my other son, just normal? And this other son um, was expecting a child, uh, but it turned out to be out of wedlock. And somehow in this mother's 
grieving, her moral compass had been thrown off. She failed to realize that her idea of right was actually wrong. Our idea sometimes of normal isn't moral. In her view, her gay son was not okay, but her fornicating son was okay. And like many today, this grieving mother equated normal. That is all forms of heterosexual relationships, all form of opposite sex relationships as the norm, as something that actually God would bless as moral and good. I just want my son to be normal. I find this, unfortunately, to be a bit more common than we'd like in the church. For decades, even some Christian counseling for those with unwanted same-sex attractions have been to develop a heterosexual potential. My goal is to help this individual to, to develop opposite-sex attractions, but does the Bible truly promote heterosexuality in all its forms? Yes, heterosexuality, that might constitute the correct direction. And yes, marriage can be considered a form of a heterosexual relationship, but it is not the only form of heterosexual relationship. And remember that heterosexuality is not equivalent to marriage, nor is marriage equivalent to heterosexuality. Because what is heterosexuality? Being attracted to some of the opposite sex, being sexually intimate with some of the opposite sex. That's a pretty broad definition. So broad that I could be sleeping with half a dozen women. That's considered heterosexual, right? I could be cheating on my wife with another woman. That's considered heterosexual. I could be living with my girlfriend. We've been together for several years, and we've never been with anyone else. We have a couple children together. That's also considered heterosexual, but all sinful in God's eyes. God would never use a category that included so much sin. Because when we celebrate this, we could be celebrating sin. For some, people even consider those success stories. I uh, met a young man, and he was a, um, a young adult's pastor, and he was telling me about um, one of the people that, that went to his church. He was also a young man, uh, also kind of similar to myself, lived as a gay man for many years, and, um, and, this, and this individual became a Christian, and so this young adult's pastor was walking with him and, and um, I guess, you know, helping him or hoping that he would develop opposite-sex attractions because this individual wanted to get married. So he's telling me the story, totally honest. He was telling me the story. He was, uh, they were driving down the road uh, on the highway and pass, happened to pass by a billboard that was advertising an adult bookstore, and on it was a scantily clad woman. The pastor was driving, and this individual was in the passenger seat, and, and this passenger in the individual seat who was coming out of same-sex relationships, he looked at this billboard and he said, wow, she's hot. And the pastor even said, like, in any other situation, I would have gave a Christian rebuke. But actually in that moment, we celebrated. The objectification of women or any person is never right. Lust is lust. Sin is sin. So by simply stating that heterosexuality is right or is God's standard without any qualification, actually we could be tacitly endorsing sexual immorality, even when we don't mean to. Certainly not all forms of heterosexual behavior are sinful. Yes, the union between a husband and wife is blessed by God, but that's not equivalent to heterosexuality so broad. So if it's not heterosexuality because it's too broad and in our world of ambiguity, let us not be ambiguous as well. So it's not heterosexuality too broad enough. Homosexuality is rooted in the fall, and that also isn't something that we can hold up as a standard. Then what is it? Holy sexuality. What is holy sexuality? So that's the title of my book. So it's not holy sexuality, Batman, even though that's what we you know, want to do. It's holy sexuality in the gospel. Uh, but we wanted to uh, have 
on there, you know, holy sexuality, what is it? When I read through the full, full counsel of God, there's actually only two paths that God has called us to be on. One path, if you are single, how do you live regarding your sexuality? You're going to be faithful to God by being sexually abstinent. If you are not single and you are married, how do you live faithful to God regarding your sexuality? You live faithful to God by being faithful to your spouse of the opposite sex. So holy sexuality is chastity and singleness and faithfulness in marriage. And what I realized was there was no term that included both of these, chastity and singleness, faithfulness in marriage. Those are the only two paths that God has put out for us for us to be on. If you're single, chastity. And why? I, I prefer chastity over abstinence. As abstinence is just simply saying what you shouldn't do. Chastity is not only saying what you shouldn't do, but it's also it, it's talking about purity and holiness. And so if chastity and singleness, faithfulness and words, and why did I choose faithfulness as opposed to chastity? Because I think faithfulness is more about faithfulness regarding your, not just sexually, but emotionally, relationally, spiritually, all of that. So it's being faithful to your spouse of the opposite sex if you're married. And notice that I'm saying two paths. I don't say two options because I often hear that because, well, I don't have that option. I don't view these as two paths because God puts us on these paths, not us. When we try to put us on a certain path, I think that oftentimes is when we can go into error. If you try to become married apart from the will of God, mistake. I was uh, actually just in Jackie Hill Perry's uh, great workshop, which, by the way, that's another book. You, I'm giving you lots and lots of books you, you guys should read, but these are a wonderful book, Jackie Hill Perry. And, and she was asked about, uh, you know, whether we should encourage people uh, to get married. And I, I'm like, what she said was, I want to yell, amen. Um, but, you know, this is a more white congregation and not if it was African-American, you know, we would have. So, you know, we have to do that, you know, with our inward voice. <laughs> Uh, but I love that. And it's like, no, I mean, I, I, we're going to encourage people to follow Christ, die to yourself, live fully for Christ. So it's two paths. God puts us on either path. It's not really our choice. Because honestly, I mean, when, when I hear people say, well, I didn't choose singleness. And it's like, of course you didn't. Because I've never met anyone who was born married. Think about it. <laughs> never. You just are. It's default. It's not your choice. Because if you think about it, we're, we begin single and we will also end single. So I hate to break the news to you, but as Jesus says in Matthew 22, we will all be single in eternity. But you know why? We will be wed to the Lamb of God. So holy sexuality, it's, it's the, these two baths. And honestly, I'm not really presenting anything monumental. Nothing really new. It's just biblical. And I mean, yes, and this might be a new phrase you never heard about, but it's really simply just articulating what God is. I mean, from Genesis to Revelation, clearly throughout Scripture, it's either chastity and singleness, faithfulness in marriage. And so this term, holy sexuality, is really meant to simplify and disentangle the complex and confusing conversation around sexuality. Hence, my book, Black and white. It's not as complicated as we make it. It was very intentional as we were designing our, I, I wanted the inside of the book to communicate clarity and I wanted the cover to communicate clarity. There is really no ambiguity when it comes to God's perfect ways, especially related to sexual purity. Because here's the truth. God's standard of holy sexuality is good news for all. So instead of determining on how we ought to live based on our sexual desires, we need to really uh, base it quite simply upon our call to holiness. But you might ask, well, what's the harm in it? You know, I mean, what's the harm if, if an individual wants to get married and he might be experiencing same-sex attraction? What's the harm in maybe helping this individual to develop opposite-sex attractions? You know, so like, like, let's say there's a young lady and she wants to marry and then she maybe came out of lesbian relationships, but, but she knows it's not God's will and, and, and she wants to marry a man. So shouldn't it be kind of natural that we help her to become attracted to the opposite sex? So I disciple uh, men at, at Moody 
And many of these men want to get married, especially, I mean, I teach at Moody Bridal Institute, so I mean, that should go without saying. <laughs> but here's the truth. Sexual desire should never be the bedrock of any marriage. When I disciple young men who want to marry, whether they have opposite sex attractions or same sex attractions, I never focus upon sexual desires. That somehow you need to develop stronger sexual desires for the opposite sex. If a young man wants to marry, you know what's the best way to prepare for marriage? Be a godly man. If you're a young woman and you want to marry, be a godly woman. My goal is simply to point people to Christ because I can't do anything. I can't change a heart. I can't make anyone holy. Only God can. And so my goal is simply to point them to the only one that can make any difference in their lives, not me. So holy sexuality, chastity and singleness, faithfulness, marriage, it's really good news for everyone. And like I said, I've been teaching at, at Moody uh, for 11 years, amazingly. God has such a sense of humor because I've never never even thought when I was moody or in seminary that I would teach. It was actually the last thing. They, I had a professor of mine call and ask, what are you doing? You know, this is after I got my master's or right before I was getting my master's. I'm like, if you know, let me know because I have no clue. And he asked if I would teach. And I did the kind of typical, um, you know, Christian no. I'll pray about it. <laughs> and this is the problem, you know, I did. <laughs> I did. So I, I'm now teaching in the Bible and theology department. And so I went from prisoner to professor. How about that for a resume? <laughs> but, you know, minister, I love ministering to youth and young adults. And, and a big question that they often ask is, who am I? I think that's a question that we all ask ourselves. Who am I? It's a question definitely we asked ourselves when we were teenagers. Adults going through midlife crisis ask themselves that question. If you're an empty nester, kind of, now what is my purpose in life? Who am I? For some, self-identity is something that is a lifelong struggle, lifelong quest. Some people find their identity in their work, in sports, and hobbies. Still others find their identity in their sexuality. Yet do these substitutes for identity truly describe who we are or what we do or what we experience? I think too often we make our identity not on truly who we are, but on what we do or what we experience. And more specifically, sexuality. Should that be who we are? Or does sexuality truly describe how we are? Sexuality shouldn't describe who we are, but it should describe how we are. Because how we answer that question, who am I? Because we talk a lot about identity. And so I, I, I don't, let's not even use that word identity, but let's just answer that question, who am I? Because how we answer that actually will greatly impact many facets of our life. It impacts how we think, the choices we make, the relationships we build. Our thoughts, our actions, are all influenced at some level by how we answer that question, who am I? And that kind of suggests a close relationship between essence and ethics. Essence, who am I? Ethics, how shall I live? There's, when you have a flawed understanding of who we are, that will result in a flawed understanding of how we live. Flawed essence results in flawed ethic. Personhood affects practice. Practice affects personhood. That's why this question about who we are and how sexuality relates to this or doesn't or shouldn't relate to it is of utmost importance. And we miss that. When we have a gay friend, how do we approach it? Like, first of all, when, how do I tell him this is sin? as if morality will get you into heaven or as if heterosexuality will get you into heaven, right? You know, when I identified as a gay man, my whole world was gay. All my friends were gay. I lived in an apartment complex that was 95% gay men. 
I worked out at a gay gym. I shopped at a gay Kroger. My whole world was gay. <laughs> Everything. All my friends told me this is who I was. This is the core of who I was. Everything, the whole, and everyone around me affirmed that. So you see that this issue goes beyond just simply bad exegesis or interpretation of a few passages. This, this understanding, this ontological in, in question goes, is much more important than simply how shall we live because it impacts that. Because being gay, when we say being gay means this is who I am, it really re reveals a deeper philosophical and theological misunderstanding. And it's a faulty pre presupposition that points to essence when it shouldn't point to essence. Some people even say, this is the core of who you are. Matthew Vines, gay activist, says this is who you are. It's simply a part of who you are, he says. As humans, our sexuality is the core part. The core. Should, should sexuality, our sexual and romantic desires, be the core of who we are? In this conversation around sexuality, this subtle shift from what to who has created a radically distorted understanding of personhood. Honestly, I don't see of any other sin issue that's so closely linked with sin, that we have taken sin and made it who I am. I don't see that. If you're a liar, that's not who you are, that's what you do. If you are an adulterer, I don't see that as who you are, but that's what you have done or what you may still be doing. If you are a murderer, that's what you have done. I don't see that as who you are, but somehow when it comes to sexuality, we have conflated sexuality with who we are. When in actuality, it just should describe how we are. So we have elevated experience to, in essence, become God. So in other words, sola experientia has won out over sola scriptura. So who am I? Who are we? Who are you? This really, really fundamental ontological question is really foundational to wrapping our heads around this topic of same-sex attractions because we, we can't even properly and even begin to understand human sexuality until we start with theological anthropology. What is theological anthropology? I mean, that's, that's multifaceted, but how does that, what does that relate to Sexuality, image of God, doctrine of sin. We always need to start there. Why? I mean, what's, what's kind of the implications of that? Well, first of all, image of God, when we understand that everyone is created in the image of God, that should be an indictment for those Christians who disdain the gay community who mist or, or treat the gay community as somehow the people that are ruining our country and this world. You know the term gay agenda? I never even heard of that phrase until I became a Christian. My agenda was simply to be who I was. I had the wrong understanding of who I was. But I think it's a condemnation for those people who claim to be Christians and yet somehow forget that everyone is created in the image of God and that means everyone is value in God's eyes. That, that everyone has value. Does that mean that we shouldn't warn people of sin? Of course not. But I don't think that should necessarily be the first thing we need to do. I mean, would we do that with a neighbor who's living with his girlfriend? You know, here's a casserole, you know you're living in sin. <laughs> not good pre-evangelism, by the way. Then why, for some reason, do we think that that must be the first thing or one of the first things that we share with our gay neighbor or gay coworker? I mean, if we're going to talk about the wrath of God, let's do it like D.L. Moody did. D.L. Moody, you know, people even say at that time that he was the only one who was qualified to preach on hell. Do you know why? He did it with tears. Are you preaching? When you talk about our own brokenness, you do it with tears. 
so image of God, but also having this incorrect diagnosis that somehow we forget about sin nature. How many of you have ever heard that the root cause or root causes of homosexuality is an absentee father, dominant mother, or abuse in one's childhood? Anyone hear that before? And this kind of comes from a, a framework, a reparative therapy, conversion therapy. And, and if you've heard or read in my work, um, I'm not an advocate, and, but I, I do need to make a caveat. Although I'm not an advocate, I'm also not one to, uh, to support government making it illegal. Um, first of all, what does government know about psychology or anything? I mean, for that matter. I mean, if that's not government overreach, I don't know what is. But root cause. In other words, a deficient and imperfect childhood is somehow the culprit for same-sex attractions. And yet, Christians, we've often blindly accepted this as the supposed root causes without any critical biblical reflection. Often studies are mentioned, but unfortunately, I think these studies show correlation, not causation. And I know in this room, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that some of you have a loved one who's gay. Maybe you have a son or daughter. And I know oftentimes parents have asked, what did I do wrong? How could I have prevented this? Please hear me. It's not your fault. You could have been a perfect parent. Your children are still sinners. Look at Adam and Eve. Did they not have a perfect father? Did they not have a perfect environment? They still rebelled. <laughs> what makes us think we can do any better? You know, the primary goal of a Christian parent is not necessarily to produce godly children. That's not your main goal. You know what's your main goal, parent? To be a godly parent. You can control that. You're not God. We need to remember that the gift of faith, of justification, of salvation are not yours to give, mom and dad. You be godly. Point your children to Christ. Not to say that bad childhood has a detrimental effect on us. It does, but I see those more as catalysts to the main cause of our sin nature. Catalyst is not a cause because when we begin focusing upon the secondary issues, it distracts us from the main issue. When you're not feeling well, you want your doctor to diagnose you correctly, right? If your doctor doesn't diagnose you correctly, he most likely will not be able to treat you correctly. But I think we've diagnosed this incorrectly, treating this as a developmental disorder, trying to dig into one's past. But honestly, that's more Freudian than biblical. Because it's quite simple. Sin is the problem. Christ is the answer. And yet I get kind of people who push back and say, well, well that sounds too simple. Doesn't salvation also sound too simple? <laughs> the more we try to fix ourselves and save ourselves and make ourselves holy, the more we will fail. That doesn't mean you don't do anything, but that means that you do things only empowered by the grace of God. This is a great understanding of grace, and I'm going to quote, quote John Piper again, and I don't know if I'm going to get exactly right, but he said, grace is not just forgiveness of sins. It's the ability to sin no more. So grace is not just pardon, it's power. And it's when we live in that power grounded in grace that we will recognize that sin is the problem. Sin is the problem. Christ is the answer. But also, we're talking about this ontological question, who am I? I mean, at core, one question that we hear from the world, and actually also from Christians. Are people born gay? I mean, I've been this way as long as I remember. 
You know, I, even parents, they're like, man, I mean, when my kid was just a little, you know, toddler, I, I could sense something different. Are people just born gay? And if we just look strictly at scientific studies, and there's been a lot, studies on causation of a same-sex orientation, nothing to date has been proven or replicated. And honestly, we are far from figuring out what exactly are the causes. We, we are far from that. But looking at science is not enough. We need to look at God's word. And God's word tells us that we're created in the image of God and that we all have a sin nature. Was that a choice? Did you choose, like, did you wake up, you know, when you were three and be like, you know what, I'm going to be a sinner, why not? (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to take on this sin nature. No, not a choice. Psalm 51, David, we're all born into sin. In sin did my mother conceive me. Not a choice. Does that mean then that we're born, you know, people are born gay? No. Because note that a predisposition is different from a predetermination. I think we all might be born with a certain predisposition, but that doesn't mean that no matter what happens, you will give in to that or you will do that. Innateness doesn't also mean that it's permissible. For being born a sinner doesn't make sin right. But even though in the lack of just so much scientific, a a lack, so much, such a lack of scientific evidence that people are born gay. There's still almost certainty in pop culture that people are born gay. And though we can point them to the lack of evidence, there's something more even important and profound that is just our gospel foundational truth. That even though you think or your friends might think that people are born gay, you know what Jesus says? You must be born again. So it doesn't matter whether you think you're born an alcoholic. You must be born again. It doesn't matter you think you're born a Porn addict, you must be born again. It doesn't matter if you think you were a liar or a cheater, you fill in the blank. You must be born again. That is not a message just for the gay community. That is a message for the world. You must be born again. You are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. There's nothing more gospel than that. Because to be honest, when I was living as a gay man, you know my biggest sin was not being in a same-sex relationship. My biggest sin was unbelief. That is what separated me from God. So when we approach our gay loved one, our lesbian coworker, and we want to share them biblical truth, share them the power of the gospel. And even before you do that, live it. Before you preach the gospel, live the gospel. Because it is in this gospel that we are changed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We praise you, Lord God, for the gospel. Something that we did not deserve. God, I ask that every person here in this room, here at Gospel Coalition at this conference, Lord, that we would never, never fall out of love with Jesus and the beautiful message that he died for. God, enable us in our brokenness, even in these difficult conversations that we have that are often pointed, that often try to trap us or we to get us to debate. Lord, help us to not focus upon simply morality but help us to focus simply on Jesus. Lord, we love you. Help us to love you more. And we ask this in the beautiful, matchless name of Jesus, the Messiah. And the people of God said, amen. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Gospel Coalition podcast. 
For more gospel-centered resources, visit thegospelcoalition.org.